Naomi has selected six scriptures to be read this morning. <laughs> However, the first three all have the same message. So I'm going to read the scripture and then I will tell you where it is found. So, greet one another with a holy kiss. Romans 16:16. 16, 16. 1 Corinthians 16:20. 2 Corinthians 13:12. Greet all brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. 1 Thessalonians 5, 26. Greet one another with a kiss of love. 1 Peter 5, 14. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement, that they would never see his face again. Acts 20, 36 to 38. You may or may not know that my spouse, Mark, is the first in his family of origin to be born in the United States. His mother is from Austria, and his father is from Germany. When I first met his extended German family, likely at a holiday event in the mid-1990s, I was initially a little taken aback by the greeting system. Cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents, old and young, all greeting each other with a kiss first on one cheek and then the other. It starts the moment you step in the front door to greet the host, and then kisses left and right down the hall and around the room you go, when you arrive and when you depart. It was a little foreign for me, cheek to cheek, close intimate contact with people I barely knew. And yet there was a sense of welcome in that ritual, a sense of care, a sense of belonging, family. Over the past few weeks, we have been considering some important practices and beliefs in the history of the Church of the Brethren and how those practices and ideals are relevant and meaningful, perhaps in new ways for us today. One of the primary ideals for the German Baptist Brethren was that of obedience to the plain sense of Scripture. Romans 12, 1 says, be not conformed to this world, and so the early brethren found it critical to separate themselves, their community, from that of the world, made very visible in the plain dress and the community's practice that gave clear and visible separation. Jesus washes his feet, washes the feet of his disciples, and instructs them to do the same in John 13. And so the brethren do exactly that, feet washing as part of the love feast service. And the brethren practiced the holy kiss because it is in scripture. As we have heard, several of Paul's and Peter's letters and the book of Acts all indicate that this kiss is the behavior in which communities should engage as the way to greet one another and as a way to say farewell. None of the authors of the letters or writers give any explanation about the holy kiss other than to identify that it should happen. So it might be presumed that this was something with which the audience was already familiar. For the early brethren, we are talking about the holy kiss as same gender, mouth to mouth contact, usually paired with the right hand of fellowship. The meaning of this kiss in these scriptures has been interpreted in a few different ways. One suggestion is that the intent of the holy kiss is to strengthen or highlight and focus on the familial ties between participants. Using language such as brother and sister was common, again, in following the scriptural model of redefining family beyond biological boundaries to a new understanding of the family of Christ. Another suggested meaning is that of pneumatic exchange, and that pneumatic should be familiar. We discussed pneuma a couple of weeks ago. Or a ritual to aid the spiritual flowing between participants. We greet each other in social settings in many ways. Shaking hands, an embrace, 
With the onset of COVID came attempts at elbow or foot bumps. I remember that from early 2020. Fist bumps, and there's always the reliable hand wave, a smile, a verbal hello. But a kiss means something more. Without getting too squirmy, I think we can probably agree that a kiss is a symbol of intimacy. And that can play out in a number of different ways, including romantic love or the love between family members or friends. Modern culture has shifted away from this as a symbol for anything else except romantic love. And so I'm not going to suggest that we push back against culture and attempt to reinstate this particular physical gesture. That would probably have a tough time gaining ground today. But I do wonder if we can reclaim the essence of the holy kiss. The family reference and the exchange of the spirit are valuable. But I'd like to suggest that we think of the holy kiss as a holy moment, a holy moment of connection. What does holy mean? Something sacred, dedicated or consecrated to God, blessed, spiritually whole and pure. And in that sacredness, in that holiness, a moment, a glimpse, a spark of holiness, connecting one to the other, uniting, joining two. What if our interactions with each other always began and ended with that? For the early brethren, the first time one experienced the holy kiss was after baptism, as they were received into full participation in the life of the congregation. This is when one became a brother or sister in faith, and the holy kiss confirmed it. The holy kiss was also shared during feet washing at love feast, before communion, at worship, and when meeting each other in public, the practice was a clear indication of who was included as part of the brethren group. If the behavior of a member was out of line with the expectations of the congregation, the holy kiss was withheld, signifying that they had fallen out of favor with the brethren. The kiss was a symbol for those who saw themselves part of the group of true Christians who were seeking to reach back into primitive, ancient Christian practices, thus the desire to closely follow and obey the instructions from the biblical text. Greet one another with a holy kiss. There was sometimes tension around the practice of the holy kiss. Samuel Weir had been an enslaved person for a family who, after a life-changing event, decided to join the Dunkards, or the Brethren, in Virginia. But they were not permitted to join while participating in enslavement practices, so Samuel Weir was freed. He ended up joining the Brethren as well in 1843, and eventually moved to Ohio and became a minister in 1872, and was ordained an elder in 1882. We have some of his story captured by Landon West, father of Dan West, in writings from 1897, which describes the tension around Samuel and the holy kiss. And I quote, and he, Samuel Weir, being the first colored member received by the church in that part of Virginia, it was soon a question as to how he should be received by the brethren after baptism, whether with the right hand and kiss of charity or with only the right hand of fellowship. But after some consideration by the church, it was decided to receive him with the right hand of fellowship, but without the salutation. And in this manner, he was received as a member." End quote. Meaning, because he was black, he did not receive the holy kiss. Later, concerns about the holy kiss were more related to hygiene and comfort. Men with long mustaches, moisture in their mustaches, or beards and chins stained from tobacco juice became problematic. And I quote, if there are unsound teeth 
or the fumes of tobacco, a part of it is lodged there. Now, my dear brethren, this makes it very unpleasant to us who feel that we would like to extend to them with the heart of love, the right hand of fellowship, accompanied with the salutation of the holy kiss. Would it not be reasonable that our brethren should at least go this far as to trim their mustache back to such an extent that the salutation can pass in harmony and peace and union? At the annual meetings in 1885 and 1898, these concerns were raised, but nothing was changed. In 1907, there was a more formal proposal to modify the practice, but ultimately the traditional order was upheld by annual conference. Finally, with concern for what might happen if the practice of the holy kiss were lost, In 1926, a congregation sent a query through their district, noting that some of the traditional behaviors were no longer being enforced, including the use of the holy kiss, which was, quote, a violation of scripture and annual meeting decisions, and requesting that annual meeting make a strong effort to regain unanimity of faith and practice in the church, that confidence and quiet may be restored. The congregation that sent that query? Elizabethtown. Of course, as history goes, the holy kiss and many other visible marks of the brethren were eventually abandoned. Instead, the community leaned into personal choice and inclusivity as an emphasis on generic principle over specific application. For most of us, this makes a lot of sense. But it is also true that we can simultaneously recognize what was lost as this practice was abandoned, a loss of some of the distinctive behaviors that defined a community, a loss of some of the intimacy that was unique and underappreciated, even ridiculed by a modernizing society, a practice that brings us into intimate connection with community members where we must confront our problematic ideologies and judgments and isms. At the same time, it was and is necessary to be attentive to personal boundaries and relational appropriateness and hygienic concerns. Our unity as brethren now tends to lie more in ideals and thoughts than physical appearance and ritual greeting. More than one of my mentors in ministry have talked about their experience with holy moments as a very vital part of pastoral life. For many, holy moments are what keep them going. A holy moment, an experience of the Spirit's presence, but not just noticed by me or by you, connecting self to Spirit, as we might individually experience during a moving music piece or a meditative or prayerful experience. But the Spirit's presence of connection between two, an often brief moment of knowing and being known, a unique shared moment of care and love and co-immersion in the Spirit. I think this is what the holy kiss was intended to induce. Interestingly, I find this rarely happens in the setting like this, in which people spend most of their church time gathered together in a sanctuary for a worship service, most of us out there and just one or two of us up here. There are moments for sure that I catch your eye and we may experience a unique connection. But I find it interesting that this moment right now, the sermon experience, is perhaps the least likely place for a holy kiss kind of holy moment. For most of us, a holy moment is much more likely to happen in times of active relationship, sitting around a campfire or a dinner table, lingering in the pews after worship or in the parking lot after choir practice, perhaps at a hospital bedside 
when a word and a moment takes on a special meaning or in the act of baptism, or child dedication, or while washing feet, or breaking communion bread, or standing holding a hymnal with the person beside you. Times when physical contact and closeness create a moment of mysterious spiritual energy between two people, perhaps in the eye contact and smile or tears of authentic, warm, genuine greeting and farewell. Perhaps more than a handshake, but a hand embrace. Or a full body embrace when both parties consent. The physicality of this gesture can bring us into holy connection. And it's good for you too. An embrace of 20 seconds or more can lead to reduced blood pressure, reduced stress, and improved mood. We may not use lips as often anymore for this practice of the holy kiss, but there are so many other ways that spiritual intimacy and connection can be affirmed between two people. It requires openness, vulnerability, trust, and attentiveness. Without the holy kiss moment, We are just a collection of humans showing up for ourself. It is critical that we are showing up for and with each other. Who are we willing to experience a holy kiss moment with or not? Who and what are we willing to do to create moments like this to exist. The holy space is the place, the space where we acknowledge that yes, our decision and discernment processes are important, our preferences and our dislikes are to be respected, but the sacred holiness of God within and between is what holds us together in ways that our humanity cannot and does not. I think we must invest in the holy kiss in whatever form we now find that meaningful. Not only do we have the opportunity to experience a holy kiss moment with those whom we greet and see regularly, but we retain a holy connection to those who have passed from this life to the next. In this way, our holy kiss no longer is a physical connection, but we maintain a holy connection through memory, through story, through the continued evidence of these beautiful humans in the next generation and the next, and each generation that is to come. A holy kiss of sorts between the now and the not yet, this world and the next. A sacred exchange of love with the trust and faith that will continue to flourish as we experience holy kiss moments with one and then another until we have enveloped the entire community in the presence of God's holy love. May it be so.